Dear Mom and Dad, I've been at a sleepaway camp for almost three weeks, and I'm getting very scared. With summer finally upon us, I felt it was time to do a nice little summer slasher. One that's perfectly normal. One that doesn't have some crazy twist ending. No, this one is both very normal and isn't controversial at all in today's day and age. Aw oh, hell, you saw the title. You know I'm lying. Today on Real Slashers, we're taking a look at the summer camp movie with an ending you'll never forget. With 1983's Sleep... Actually, take it from here, trailer guy. Sleep away, camp. You won't be coming home. I packed you and your cousin some goodies for the ride up to camp. Wasn't that nice of me? Hmm? Sleepaway Camp is pretty much the prototype for how a summer camp slasher should be. Sure, Friday the 13th came before it, but this one actually has a functioning summer camp at its center. So if anything really deserves the title of Camp Slasher, it's this one. The movie opens up on a dedication to the film's mother, who was apparently a doer? Whatever that means. And it turns out the director Robert Hiltzik was only able to make the film due to an inheritance from said mother. And the only films he's ever been involved with are solely in this franchise. Ah, it's all starting to make sense. We first get this absolutely batshit insane water skiing segment. There's a lot going on here. When the water skier's boat hits and kills the father and one of the children, it's one of the more shocking aspects of a pretty damn shocking movie. As dumb as things can get here, the big moments really hit hard. Eventually, we get to see the camp a few years later as Angela and her cousin Ricky set off for adventures at the same establishment. Angela is the surviving child of the boat accident. Remember that, because it's pretty damn important later. Once at the camp, Angela struggles and gets relentlessly bullied. But the people at the camp start getting offed, starting with this super creepy pedo cook. He has one of the more disturbing deaths, with even his skin bubbling up. But to say he deserved it is a bit of an understatement. Where I come from, we call them baldies. Makes your mouth water, don't it? The rest of the movie follows this similar format. Someone does something to hurt Angela, and then they're offed in a brutal way. I think one of the most disturbing scenes in this whole movie is when this counselor comes back to camp and sees the massacred bodies of all the boys he was supposed to be looking after. There's not a lot of good acting in this movie, but goddamn does this guy just nail it here. And it's not like he was off being neglectful. He was taking one of the other boys back to camp because he was scared. He was being a good counselor. Just makes the tragedy hit even harder. And then by the time the ending happens, you just don't even know what to expect. We'll get into that in slicing up a scene, so... Well, yeah, let's just get to it. Angela. Such a lovely name. Why, I believe it means angel. Why, yes, I'm sure it does. I know you're going to like that name. Won't you, Peter? If there was ever a scene that was so pivotal for us to slice up, it would be the ending to Sleepaway Camp. After loads of bodies keep popping up, the counselors go looking for missing campers, as well as the killer. They find Ricky's body, but he's still alive, just unconscious after a rather irate Mel beats him half to death. Guess he really wanted to get with Meg. In the midst of all this chaos, Paul is completely oblivious and wants to go skinny dipping with Angela. Talk about priorities. As Ronnie and Susie arrive on the lakeshore, they see Angela sitting with Paul laying on her lap. She's stroking his hair tenderly. It almost feels like a sweet moment. That's when the batshit insane flashback starts and this movie gets ramped up to 11. I just hope that Richard doesn't get jealous that I didn't get him anything. Oh, but then he is such a dear, I'm sure that he won't mind. Angela's crazy aunt gives such an insane performance that it just makes the exposition feel even more like a fever dream than it already is. See, Aunt Martha reveals that it was actually Angela that died in the boating accident, and that Peter was the one that survived. But she already had a boy in Ricky, so she couldn't possibly have two boys. Ridiculous. So she forced young Peter to become a girl and call himself Angela. Yeah, you can see where this would be a tad... controversial. 
When we're back on the beach, we see that Angela has killed poor Paul and is holding on to his decapitated head. That's when we get one of the most memorable shots in all of horror. God damn. Could you imagine doing this segment and not revealing who the killer is? While the film does a good job of playing a whodunit, even clearly using Ricky in a shot to further trick the viewer, the final twist of Angela being the killer hits hard in so many ways. We watch throughout the movie as Angela is just so timid and shy, where it's hard to even imagine her even standing up for herself, let alone killing a bunch of people. So the fact that all of these heinous murders were perpetrated by such a seemingly sweet and innocent girl makes it that much more fucked up. Melissa Rose took on the part of Angela Baker and does a good enough job. Not much is really required of her other than being super quiet and awkward. But the real slam dunk with her performance is how much you just don't suspect her. I mean, she is just 13 years old here, so it's not exactly tough to look unintimidating, but then add to the fact that everything seems to be pointing at Ricky standing up for his cousin Angela, and Felissa's constantly timid performance, and all the signs seem to be pointing towards Ricky. Hell, it seems like a stiff breeze would completely topple Angela. But the reveal makes everything come together where the 180 works. Despite her very subtle performance, Felissa has made a whole career out of it, appearing at horror convention after horror convention. If you want to find out a little bit about the other Angela Baker portrayed by Pamela Springsteen, then check out our first ever real slashers on Sleepaway Camp 2. She'll always be my preferred version, but there's no denying the original. She takes showers when no one can see. She has no hair down below. Judy, she's a real carpenter's dream. If you're a heterosexual male, you're going to be pretty let down by the contents here. Outside of a brief shower scene with Meg, in which you don't see anything, there's not a lot of exploitation going on here. However, if you're into man butts and even a little pecker action, then this has got plenty for you. In fact, all it needs is a little bedroom gyrating and it'd be about as gay as Nightmare Part 2. Eat shit and die, Ricky! Eat shit and live, Bill. Sleepaway Camp released on November 18th, 1983 in New York City and brought in... Huh. Well, apparently those numbers aren't available. Hmm. Sleepaway Camp released on May 25th, 1984 in Los Angeles and brought in... 90 grand? Wait, that can't be right, can it? Well then. Thankfully, despite its rough start, this has gained quite the cult status over the years due to its extremely controversial ending. It quickly became the talk of video stores everywhere. Did you see the ending of Sleepaway Camp? There have been three sequels in the meantime, or well, four if you count this half-ass sequel, mostly unfinished film. We've got Unhappy Campers, Teenage Wasteland, The Survivor, and Return to Sleepaway Camp. There was even a short film made in 2014 that followed Karen Field's Judy character. So they've gotten plenty of mileage out of this IP. There have even been reports of a reboot, as well as another sequel titled Sleepaway Camp Reunion. As to whether any of this actually comes to fruition is anyone's guess. I somehow don't think another inheritance is coming Hiltzik's way. Like we've mentioned on this show time and time again, Scream Factory released the definitive version of this film on Blu-ray back in 2014. They really are just the kings of horror Blu-ray and DVD. The film is presented fully uncut with a cleaned up 2K scan of the original camera negative. It's easily the best the film has ever looked much better than the old VHS copy I saw as a kid. The movie has even been featured on Bad Movie Podcast after Bad Movie Podcast, with my favorite being an all-time classic episode of How Did This Get Made, where they come up with some truly baffling realizations. The mother that we met, the creepy mom, yeah. that's Angela's cousin. Nope. Aunt. Nope. Aunt. Aunt. It's, Aunt. Angela's, I, I thought, it's Angela's are, mother. Just amazing. The movie's controversial nature has only expanded over the years, with the ending even being accused of being transmisogynistic, 
Sure, they don't exactly treat Angela's trans status as anything but an absolute shock and awe moment, but look at the era it came out in. If anything, the film brings up some interesting questions. I'm sure that many people thought that this film would just be lost to time, and had it not been for its insane ending, this would likely be true. But as controversial as those final frames are, it's clearly the right creative decision, because it kept us talking about it to this day. Angela, the official Sleepaway documentary, is currently in production, so I'm sure we'll find out even more about the film before too long. What did you think of Sleepaway Camp's controversial ending? Do you think it would have left just as much of an impact without the twist? Sound off in the comments and we'll see you in the next one. And shout out to mom, a doer. When discussing the horror films of the 80s and 90s, it would be nearly impossible to not mention the slasher genre. The brain dead stories, ridiculous kills, and clueless characters often meant bucket loads of fun. I mean, why root for these dumb kids when you can root for the killer instead? That was the fun of the slasher film. Unfortunately, something happened during the 90s. The violence, nudity, and swearing were deemed too much for audiences, and things took a turn that were decidedly more… meta. So the tits were gone, the swearing lessened, the kills cut short before getting to the good stuff. Effectively, the slasher genre was neutered. So we want to take it back, way back, to the before times when the blood ran like red geysers and clothes may as well have been illegal, where the weed may have been smoked, but was followed shortly by a blade to the throat. We want to look back on that glorious period of time where every Friday brought us a new location, a new group of victims, till eventually there was only one. We knew we needed a heavy hitter to start this series off right. So we thought, what exemplifies the true meaning of being a slasher? Well, it has to have a great villain. Check. There have to be great kills, check, and the shirts would certainly be better off, and check again. Well, looks like it's clear what's up first. Today, we're looking at Sleepaway Camp 2, Unhappy Campers. And here's what you get for telling evil stories and having such a filthy mouth. What a bad camper. To be able to discuss Sleepaway Camp 2, we must first discuss its predecessor. 1981 Sleepaway Camp followed the tried and true formula set by Friday the 13th, with a group of people being offed one by one until a sole survivor remains. In Friday, only the camp counselors had to worry about becoming a victim. But in Sleepaway Camp, both campers and counselors are in danger. Where it really stands out from other slashers is its ending. After a whodunit mystery, it's finally revealed that shy camper Angela Baker is actually the killer. She experienced tragedy as a child, losing her father and sibling, and upon being taken in by her aunt, is forced to live as a girl. That's right, the big twist is that the lead is a transgender killer. God, she's a boy. Whoa. It's clear that the transgender aspect was added simply to add another bit of mystery to the whodunit side of things, and not some scathing indictment of the transition itself. It allowed the filmmakers to almost entirely subvert expectations as to who the killer could possibly be. What the hell are you doing here? You see Angela throughout the film and she's simply a timid girl, a complete 180 to the strong killer that we see hints of throughout. In Unhappy Campers, we're back at summer camp. Only this time, Angela has gotten gender reassignment surgery and is therefore a lot more comfortable in her own body. Gone is the timid child from the original, and in her place is a much more confident person. The story is ridiculously simple, with the basic structure of the movie being to introduce a camper or counselor, having that character piss off Angela, you don't deserve to be a camp, and Angela proceeding to kill them. This happens again, and again, and again until no one's left. It's pretty great and takes those expectations and plays with them. This little girl right here pisses off Angela to the point that you think Angela's gonna kill her just like everybody else. It ends up being a great fake out moment, especially because in the first film, Angela actually does kill some little kids, and it's honestly one of the most shocking parts of the entire thing. So interesting subversions. Since it's a slasher, we've got our stereotypical final girl, Molly. Her character is essentially what we all thought Angela was in the first film, just a timid good girl. 
but this is where her character development ends. Unlike Nancy or Lori, Molly doesn't really have any strong qualities that make her stand out. In fact, the main reason she's chosen as the final survivor is because Angela sees herself in Molly. Not exactly a ringing endorsement. Something that may go unnoticed by most are the character names. Outside of a select few, all the characters are named after prominent 80s actors. We've got Phoebe Cates, Brooke Shields, Mary Stuart Masterson, Judd Nelson, Anthony Michael Hall, Ali Sheedy, Demi Moore, Leah Thompson, Tom Cruise, Matt Dillon, Charlie Sheen, Emilio Estevez, John Stamos, Rob Lowe, Diane Lane, Sean Penn, and of course, Molly Ringwald. Ridiculous, but oh so hysterical. Oh, and our final girl happens to be the sister of Emilio Estevez and Charlie Sheen, Renee Estevez. So it's even funnier that there are characters named after them here. And nearly every single one of these people die. That's right, we've got 18 total kills in this, so there's plenty of carnage to go around. There's a ton of off-screen kills, which sucks, but thankfully we're able to see the aftermath, so we still get to appreciate some of the practical effects work. Despite this being a horror movie, I think calling it scary would be a disservice to horror everywhere. There are no moments of terror here. We're just given kill after kill with little to no development to make us care about those murdered. The lighting is flat like a comedy, and the transitions between scares are almost comical at times. Once I start a task, I always finish. But that's the whole point. This movie is purely and simply fun. And a big part of that comes from our villainous lead. You gotta eat sometime. Even if you're sad, you gotta eat. Isn't that right, Leah? When we discuss famous slasher villains, the usual suspects tend to be Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, and Michael Myers. I mean, hell, Freddy and Jason are even parodied in this film. Yet there's one underrated gem who is as violent as Jason, as grudge-holding as Michael, and as chatty as Freddy. And that's our very own Angela Baker. While Felissa Rose was the originator of the role, it was really Pamela Springsteen that made the role so memorable, and not just a gimmick based on five seconds of screen time. And yes, when I say Pamela Springsteen, I mean that Springsteen. Pamela is the younger sister of Bruce and decided to try her hand at acting for a brief period. And she knocks it out of the park. Okay, let's get showered! Sure, Felissa Rose may have been the first, but Springsteen is what really defined the role. Now yes, Angela stands out as a villain mostly due to the ending of the first film, which saw the reveal of Angela being both a killer and a boy. But here is where she really develops and becomes the wisecracking, murder-hungry psycho. Her absurdly happy behavior paired with her murderous rage just allows for a villain that's absurdly fun. Unlike some of her contemporaries, she doesn't have any strict costuming. So long as she's dressed like a camp counselor in her rolling hill sweater, she's well in her element. And Angela really believes in equal opportunity with her killing, never favoring any one weapon. If anything, her goal seems to be adding as much variety as possible to her murder style. Oh, and see this girl? Yeah, I have no idea who this person is and why they make it seem like she's Angela. Why not just use Pamela Springsteen? And they proceed to do the same exact thing for the third film. Just use Pamela Springsteen for the cover. And speaking of crazy covers, this film was actually released as Nightmare Vacation 2 in the United Kingdom, and this is the poster. How that passes copyright law is news to me. Yeah, but well, you're more fucked up than I thought. In this new segment, slicing up a scene, we're taking a specific scene from the movie and putting it under the microscope. Whether that be breaking down a creative kill, a huge reveal, or even just a scene that makes it wholly unique. Now that you know what we're doing here, let's get started. So this is Allie. Allie has been trying the entire movie to get with Sean. However, Sean only has eyes for Molly. So Allie, being the horn dog she is, just goes for anyone in the camp. Meet anyone. This is Rob. He's just kind of there. So, after a long failed attempt at sex in the girls' bathroom, where Allie tries repeatedly, and unsuccessfully, mind you, to get Rob to go down on her, Allie and Rob are finally able to get some privacy in the woods, 
and Allie appears to be more in pain than enjoying it. But hey, that's sex as a teen. They keep going and Rob busts early. At least I can only assume that's what happens. Disgusted by this premature ejaculator, she decides to go back to her cabin to clean up, only to see that there's a note for her. Oh my god, Sean has finally come to his senses and wants to have wicked sex in the woods. Because that's totally something that Sean would do. Dumb, horny Allie. I knew you'd come around. You literally just had sex. How horny are you? So Allie's so pumped about finally getting to have sex with Sean that she doesn't even care that he seemingly invited her to some rundown cabin. Hell, if anything, she's apologetic. Sean? Sorry I'm late! Sadly, no, Sean did not magically come around, and it was actually Angela who left the note. Angela even tells her. I didn't think you'd fall for it, you're dumber than I thought. Yes, she really is. Because she then proceeds to turn her back on the person who randomly invited her into the woods. So, after a little stab stab, Allie, um, whoa, I think she may actually be enjoying the murder more than the sex with Rob. Ouch, poor Rob. So, after the stabbing, Allie rides around a bit, and unfortunately for Allie, she didn't realize that once stabbed, your body becomes much easier to push into outhouses. Apparently. Angela, all 80 pounds of her, forces Allie into the outhouse with nothing but a stick and willpower. And she talks shit to her as she does. You pissed away your good looks and God-given talent your whole life and turned it into nothing but a cynical, dirty mouth waste of flesh. Talk about getting your hands dirty. She proceeds to shove Allie into the shithole and further shows her own genius. Leech is Allie for a leech like you. That's right. Allie pissed her off to the point that Angela decided to trick her into thinking the guy she likes is into her, pulls the rug out from under her, stabs her, and then shoves her into a bunch of piss and shit, and a bunch of leeches attached to her face while she's in the midst of drowning. Overkill? Not for Angela. Let's see Jason Voorhees put in that amount of vindictive effort. Let's keep your tits growing. Maybe you'll quit looking at mine. With how silly it is, it's incredible to see that the film is only at a 50% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Sure, it only has 10 reviews, but still, that's pretty good for a film as trashy as this. While the movie wasn't the runaway success of the first, it was enough to give us a sequel titled Sleepaway Camp 3, Teenage Wasteland. While this did see Springsteen's Angela return, it failed to capture the fun of unhappy campers. Unfortunately, the disappointment of this film led to stagnation in the series. In 1992, filmmakers tried filming Sleepaway Camp The Survivor, but the production company went bankrupt and the film was never completed. A work print cut of the film was released in the 2000s featuring all the footage that was shot, about 30 minutes, combined with footage from the original trilogy. It's a cobbled together mishmash of ideas that could hardly be considered a movie. Thankfully, Sleepaway Camp saw a bit of a resurgence in the 2000s, and production on Return to Sleepaway Camp began. This decided to retcon the second and third film and saw the return of Felissa Rose's Angela. It was a rather disappointing affair and essentially saw the end to the franchise. In recent years, the trilogy was released on individual Blu-rays from Scream Factory, Unfortunately, Unhappy Campers has since gone out of print and is therefore incredibly difficult to find in decent quality. The film comes and goes from streaming services, and at this point is your best bet at viewing this underrated slasher, unless you want to pay an arm and a leg. Which is honestly something Angela might encourage. Oh, there he is! The Sleepaway Camp series is one of the more controversial out there, mostly because of its first entry being a trailblazer in the world of gender bending. But when you look past the first film, the sequels get to a place of absolute insanity. While we've covered the second one on this show in the past, and that one is often the one that gets the spotlight, yet its sister sequel was filmed at the same time and released just one year later, and is nearly just as insane. So join us today on Real Slashers as we get into all of Angela Baker's psychopathic exploits as we cover Sleepaway Camp 3 Teenage Wasteland. I 
Ironically, Camp New Horizons was formerly known as Camp Rolling Hills, where last year 19 people were brutally slain by alleged psychopath Angela Baker. The film picks up one year after the second one left off, and for those that may have missed it, Angela Baker poses as a camp counselor and murders the entire camp until there's no one left. Yet somehow she's able to escape and the camp is trying to open just one year later. Angela takes the place of another girl and poses as Maria. Camp Arawak, or Rolling Hills, is now Camp New Horizons, and it's got an interesting gimmick. They're bringing together rich and poor kids. Yeah, that's the long and short of it, and it's just as strange as it sounds. They say they want to make sure that they can share properly and communicate. Okay then. Even the news thinks that opening up the camp is nuts and is looking to cover it. The local newswoman makes the mistake of asking Angela to get her some cocaine. It still cracks me up that this girl thinks that this camp in the middle of the woods is the best place for her to score some coke. Hell, she's going back to the city later that day. Just wait a bit. Instead, Angela gives her some Ajax cleaner and she shows the importance of testing your drugs before you do them. Brutal. The campers get separated into three different groups with the intention that they'll all come together after a couple days. But Angela doesn't let them get to that point, murdering everyone in her group, then moving on to another one, and then another one until there's no one left. Angela really has a problem with excess. When Angela is killing one of the counselors, we find out that this is the father of one of the boys from the last film. But even him being on to Angela just isn't enough, as he's off the moment that it's revealed that he knows who she is. It's honestly hilarious. You'll also notice that I haven't really talked about the final girl here. And it's not because we don't have one. We do, and her name is Marsha. But she feels rather irrelevant to the story, despite the fact that she actually stabs Angela in the end. But she spends most of the film wooing and trying to hook up with Tony, and she hardly has anything to overcome because it's all over so quickly. Not exactly final girl material. There's a nice little tag featuring Angela in the back of an ambulance. It's mostly just a way to get a couple more kills in, but it continues the absurd fun that the film loves to have. I mean, just look at this. Hey, what's going on back there? Just taking care of business. You look a little older than the rest. Massive drugs. You wouldn't know where I can uh, score some coke. Yeah, there's a machine in the dining hall. <laughs> I said it in my Unhappy Camper video, but I actually prefer Pamela Springsteen's version of the character, as she seems to just be having an absolute blast in the role. I love the glee in her eyes as she's doing any form of murder, and despite Springsteen looking like she's aged a bit between films, two and three were filmed over a six week period. So it's apparently all in the hairdo. While the unhappy camper version of Angela Baker is still my favorite, the Teenage Wasteland version has a certain edge to her that is cannot miss. The way she just moves from person to person, almost as if she can't help herself. If the opportunity to kill someone presents itself, then she is going to take it, goddammit. Unfortunately, most of the kills in the film were either cut by the MPAA or just cut due to budgetary concerns. And I'm not sure what it is about slashers released in 1989 having very weird age-defying pairings, but that continues here with camp owner Herman hooking up with Jan. This is also a nice little throwback to the just-as-weird relationship with Meg and Mel in the first film. I just wish their deaths had been a little more memorable than just a whack in the head with a stick. There are plenty of scenes to look at, but there's just something about this opening. And why does the fact that she's going to camp literally mean anything? Just do what your mom asks and turn down the damn radio. You going to camp affects nothing. But I guess there's only so much I can expect from a girl who has milkshake tattooed on her chest. This woman is clearly classy as hell. She heads out with her full denim outfit and massive hair, ready to go to camp. 
It's just so funny because nothing about this girl screams camp, yet she seems so pumped about it. Probably just happy to get away from her wonderful parents. She's walking along and suddenly we see an angle from a big garbage truck. Only nothing really seems too out of the ordinary, so it's kind of shocking when Maria just throws her bag down and decides to run from it. But it turns out that's a good thing because, you know, despite there not being any sign of it prior, the truck is after her. So rather than, you know, going to some place that the truck can't reach her, she stays in the middle of this alley, just asking to get run over. And wouldn't you know. This is when the truck driver gets out and we see that it's Angela. She's dressed exactly like the girl. Um, how did she manage to do this? I mean, I get the hair. She could have scoped her out beforehand. But the whole outfit, too? It's the kind of thing that makes no sense, and that just makes the scene even better. Which is good, because it follows it up with this insane shot of the camp bus swinging by to pick her up, and then the absurdity just continues with some new graffiti claiming that Angela is back. Yes, she is. Why are you doing this to me? Because you're a cheerleader, a fornicator, a drug taker, a nasty, snotty bigot. And besides that, you're real nice. Sleepaway Camp 3, Teenage Wasteland, released straight to video in the United States on December 15th, 1989. While the release did well enough in rentals, it wasn't until Anchor Bay's Sleepaway Camp Survival Kit released that the movie became must-own. As with the other two films in the series, Scream Factory released the film on Blu-ray and did a wonderful job remastering it. With how much they've been upgrading their catalog to 4K, it's only a matter of time before we get the series in glorious 4K. And I for one can't wait. Can you imagine this movie in 4K? Oh, I need that detail. One of the most interesting aspects of the film is who wrote it. Because you probably recognize this character actor. Michael Hitchcock is that guy in so many different comedies, yet he started off in the world of horror. He wrote both the sequels under the pseudonym Fritz Gordon. As someone who is a fan of the actor from all of his appearances in Christopher Guest movies, this was an absolute shock to learn, as the Sleepaway Camp series has been firmly in my life since I was a teenager. If only I knew who Fritz Gordon was. Yes, those are lights. Could they fall? And that's a ceiling above us. But they look shaky. No, they're not shaky. They're it's perfect. It's like that wire. I see a wire. I see it. Ow! While there are other movies that came after, I'd consider Sleepaway Camp to be the end of the series, as the other sequels are much better forgotten. Because despite it being the worst of the first three, it still provides plenty of entertaining moments. I mean, hell, I could watch Pamela Springsteen murder teenagers with a big ol' smile on her face all day long. Because if there's one thing that's missing from too many horror films these days, it's the killer having a grand ol' time. And no one quite knows how to party like Angela Baker. Well, you're just gonna cut my head off like you did my son's. What's it gonna be? A gun. 